Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, welcome to the master class. This is lesson five. Lesson five is entitled Symbolism. I'm your humble host, Chanda Sampa. Thank you everybody for tuning in right now, wherever you are watching from. Thank you for your continued support. You can actually show further support by buying some of the products that we have on offer. We have caps, backpacks, sweatpants, crop tops, you name it, we have it all. So if you want to support, all you have to do is simply go to our social media pages and then you'll be able to see what we have on offer. Um, that being said, uh, I think we can get the show on the road, but just one more formality out of the way. Uh, I'm introducing uh, a new feature on the show called uh, This Week's Readings or Prescribed Readings. So if you go back and check all the episodes from Lesson 1, there are going to be books of where I found some of the information that I'm speaking about. Um, this is so because I've been uh, getting a lot of questions and queries about where could I find this information and things of that nature. So yeah, you can do that. Just check the description and then you'll be able to see the lessons prescribed reading. So, um, where I would like to begin today, um, obviously, when you hear the word symbolism, I'm assuming some of you thought I would come with the, oh, look at this hand gesture, look at this. I already did that. So I'm talking about symbolism in a different and more intricate way. So uh, obviously, as per tradition, we started a little bit of some quotes by some wise men just that are going to set the theme of the show today, symbolism, lesson five. So the first quote is by Malcolm X. It reads, you have to be very careful introducing the truth to the black man who has never previously heard the truth about himself before. Mm. The black brother is so brainwashed that he may reject the truth when he first hears it. You have to drop a little bit on him at a time and wait to let that sink in before advancing to the next step. So this is what we're doing on the masterclass. We're giving you bit by bit. So another quote that's going to drive the theme of this lesson today. It's by Mandy P. Hall. He's actually a third degree Mason, scholar, well-renowned mm -hmm. in the literature world. He says, when the human race learns to read the language of symbolism, a great veil will fall from the eyes of men. That's what Mandy P. Hall says. So with that being said, the first thing that I want to start with is something I came across. It was a picture of a human body, right? And it made me realize, because head, or the first part of the word head, head is similar to heaven. And heaven is depicted to, or is said to be in the sky or high up. And then you have the hill, the hill being like, you know, the, the, the back of your, your foot. H double E L, that hill. And then the bottom, they say, is hell, which is opposite of head or heaven which is H-E-L-L. And then you have the sole. Do you know what the sole is? Mm. The bottom part of your foot. Oh, yes, so you have heaven, hell, and sole, yes. Mm. So the sole, that, this is why our ancestors never used to wear shoes. Cause um, African spirituality, if you'd call it that, is very much rooted with nature or in nature. So, the first thing I'm going to speak about is something known as Adam's calendar. You may remember that in the previous lesson I, I had mentioned that there are different calendars in the world and this one that we're using is the Gregorian calendar. But today I'm going to bring to the masses from your dear ancestors the truth about these calendars. So this one is called Adam's calendar and bear in mind Adam's calendar is the western version of the name has a traditional name, but we don't want to butcher it. And just for the sake of this lesson, for us to breeze through, let's just call it Adam's calendar for this lesson. So what is Adam's calendar? Adam's calendar is believed to be one of the oldest man-made structures on earth. It's sometimes referred to as African Stonehenge and was brought to public attention in 2003 by the pilot, John Hayne. Adam's calendar is a site of great historical importance as it's believed to be one of the oldest man-made structures in the world. It's made of a series of upright stones in a circle and it's one of the provincial heritage sites that can be found on South, African, South Africa's heritage trail. It was declared a national monument in 1975. 
The site is sometimes referred to as Africa Stonehenge. The ruins here are believed to be over 75,000 years old. Have you heard that? 75,000 years old. Yeah. So let me give you some more info about um, what these stone hinges mean. So one of the first things you have to know is that Adam's calendar, the reason why it's, it's said to be a calendar is because the way the stones are arranged, they're arranged in such a way that depending on the position of the sun at a certain time of the year, it's going to show you which side is weak, uh, east and west or which month you're in. So it doubles as a calendar as well. So they all seem to display strong acoustic properties. This is the author speaking about the stone hinges. They all seem to display strong acoustic properties and I call them the stones that ring like bell. This was their realization that led me to discover that sound played a critical role in the building of the ruins and the use of the energies that they create. One of the most obvious techniques I use in determining the possible edge of the tools is the patina growth that forms on the rock. This kind of patina or skin that grows on these artifacts grows at a very, very slow rate that is estimated to be about 1,000 years per microscopic layer. In other words, by the time that the patina is visible to the naked eye, it is already a few thousand years old. Most of the artifacts in my collection are completely covered in patina several millimeters thick, suggesting that these ancient tools must be well over 100,000 years old or even subsequently older. In conclusion, we are standing at the threshold of a brand new discovery that will expose great surprises and unveil a great hidden part of human history. So if you want to know more about what I just said, you can check out the book Ubuntu Contributionism, a Blueprint for Human Prosperity. Another one you can check out is uh, African Temples of the Anunnaki. So that was one of the sections. So now, one of the earliest civilizations, when you ask scholars, it's, it's de highly debated. Some say civilization started in Africa, in Egypt, others say Sumeria. Sumeria is uh, basically in between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates in the Middle East, in today what is known as Iraq, the southern part. They say that's where civilization started, depending on where you look. So how is this related to the Adam's calendar? Well, there are certain similarities that have been discovered between the Sumerian times and Adam's calendar. So, the links to the Sumerian civilization in southern Africa simply cannot be ignored or erased. They can even be traced with etymology in the names and origins of indigenous people. The most obvious evidence are the mysterious origins of the word Avanti, the name commonly used to describe black South Africans. According to Credo Muto, the name is derived from the Sumerian goddess Antu. Avantu simply means the children of Antu. So then, um, these stone hinges, by the way, at the stone hinges site, right next to them, there are also pyramids. And those pyramids are drawn on the, they are also built on the ley lines. That the great pyramids of Giza are also built on. So basically, all the pyramid structures in the earth are built on the same ley lines. Oh, Bachanda, what does ley line mean? I got you, I got you. So, ley lines are basically Earth's sacred energy grid. And if you want to know more, more about such, there's a science just for you called Akio Astronomy, which means Akio Astronomy, like archaeology and astronomy. astronomy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It means the alignment and orientation of sites to the sun, moon, and stars at certain times of the year. That's what ley lines are. So if you want to know more about the ley lines, and also uh, another thing to note is that um, the Adam's calendar was also built on those same ley lines in what is known as the Golden Meridian. So the Golden Meridian is basically in simple form, the electromagnetic fields of the earth. You see, you see what I'm saying? So now, this is where now the symbolism I'm, I'm talking about comes in. Everything that's living or everything that grows has to start from the bottom. When you look at chakras, for the crown chakra to be ignited or for the pineal gland to be opened, the third eye, others call it, you have to start from the root chakra. So for all these people who are so fascinated by the great pyramids of Giza and all that civilization in the north of Africa, I think one thing they fail to consider is that could it be that civilization actually started from the south 
of Africa. Because if we look at Adam's calendar, those stone hinges are older than the pyramids of Giza. Adam's calendar is said to be built about 100,000 years ago. You see what I'm saying? So if a human being is growing a plant, as I mentioned, the root chakra to the crown chakra, it starts from the bottom. So would it be logical to assume that perhaps the pinnacle of civilization, that is Egypt, maybe there's a possibility that maybe it started from the south because as I just mentioned, the example of growth and living things started from the bottom. And we have Adam's calendar as well to back that up. And then we have also the science of the, the golden meridian and it being on the same ley lines as all the other pyramid structures on the earth and things of that nature. So now let me go back to this Egypt. If, for instance, I'm not good at geography, so this is the best example I could come up with. So bear with me, please. Um, if you found Mexicans in Texas, it's an English-speaking place, but you found people speaking, they spoke no English in Texas, right at the cusp. What would you assume? That's for the international audience, right? You would assume that Mexico is right here, so they just crossed the border. That's an international example, a more localized example. If you found a person speaking Shona in Livingston, speaking Chewa in Chipata, speaking French in, in Mufrila, the person speaking French in Mufrila, you obviously assume, oh, since Congo is right here and they speak French, it would be logical to assume that this guy just came south. It's right here. Same thing with the Shona, uh, the Shona speaking person in Livingston. Zimbabwe is right there. Same thing with Chipata and Chewa. Malawi is right there. So then, when you look at Africa, the entire Africa just so happens to be full of black people, but only the north part is occupied by Arabs, who are also genetically Caucasians, by the way. <laughs> so, if you look at the world and see where do Arab people originate from, or where, where is the majority of the population housed? It's in the Middle East, but where is the Middle East on the map? Oh, guess what? It's right next to Africa. So, wouldn't it be logical to assume that Perhaps those people who are occupying the northern parts of Africa, like Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Libya, and such, perhaps migrated south from where Arabs originate from, from their homeland. Hmm. That's your homeland. Egypt, before Egypt was called Egypt, it was called Kemet. Oh, but what does Kemet mean? The word Kemet in today's written form, K-E-M-E-T or K-E-M-I-T in the ancient Egyptian language is translated to mean black or land of the blacks or the black land. So Egypt used to be called Kemet and Kemet means land of the blacks. Then let's have a look at um, some of the artifacts that, were, that are, are found in Egypt. What race would you say these look? Just, just giving you a few seconds to ponder. And if you notice, most of them seem to have their noses knocked off. Why do you think that is? Mm -hmm. I think it's because the most distinct features on a black person's face or on an African's face is the nose and lips. They have white noses and big lips. So if they knock off the noses, and uh, lips. Perhaps it was a ploy in hindering or stopping black people from knowing who they truly are, that they're descendants of kings and queens, that they originate from the pinnacle of civilization and were actually the chosen people. Um, it's just a thought, it's just a thought. So even when you listen to hip hop, let me then use a hip hop example. There's a song called Black Savage, uh, Royce the Five Nine Ti, but it features Sai High the Prince. So Sai yeah. uh, High said, uh, if if I rule the world, I would get back all the gold that they stole. We are postal, they know on the Sphinx. It's a wild war. They trying to steal the soul out of soul. Mm. Nigga said I sold out. I never sold out a show. <laughs> so the line I wanted to focus on was. We are post at the nose on the Sphinx. It's a wild war. What do you think that means? Why? You've seen the pictures right here. Why are the noses knocked off? So now that we've established that, indeed, civilization perhaps could have started in the South because Adam's calendar supports that. It's 100,000 years old. 
according to white researchers. Because we're bringing the white receipts, because if a black man says it, he say, oh no, he, he's scalping. So the white man said, it's 100,000 years old, he did his research, he has his receipts, I've given you his books, we'll read further, right? Then we've also established that Egypt used to be called Kemet, and Kemet means land of the black, and the whole Africa is black. So what does that mean? It means possibly that there were black people in Egypt, that the people who were running the cradle of civilization as we know it, we are black, indeed black people like you and I. I'm just here to deliver the message from your ancestors. Since uh, a lot of people like looking up to the whites and, you know, Western civilization mm -hmm. and their artifacts and their culture. By the way, uh, before I move on, let me just give you an aerial view or a view of Adam Scala, just so you know how it looks like. It may look simple to you, but there's deep uh, energy uh, mathematics, science, geology, you name it. Everything is encoded in the building of, of, uh, of the Adam's calendar. And here's another book that you will check out. It's called Pyramid Power. The secret energy of the ancients revealed the world's greatest mystery. It shows that the pyramids actually have power. These pyramids or these artifacts that Africans had before um, the, the, the foreign entities came and colonized and ripped and pillaged our cultures. They harness power. They, they are used for power. Don't believe me? Okay. There's a, a thin structure. It looks like a tower, but this is what it looks like. It's called an obelisk. So I want to focus on three obelisks, right? That we are taken from. There are actually more, but I just want to focus on these three. Two were taken from Egypt specifically, and one was built. So there's an obelisk in London that was taken from Egypt, and there's an obelisk that was taken from Kenya to the Vatican. The third one I'm, I'm going to talk about was built in Washington, D.C. So if you look at London, in my humble opinion and my research, it seems London is one of the financial capitals of the world. I'm talking about the city of London, the institution. Yes, the one that operates like a state. So for us Africans, who determines, not even in the, on the world market, who determines the prices of minerals? It's the London Metal Exchange. So you see, there's an obelisk where the finances are handled, right? Then there's another obelisk in the Vatican. I even have an article here that says, the Vatican obelisk. Why is there an ancient Egyptian obelisk in St. Peter's Square? Images of St. Peter's Square are frequently broadcast around the world. Perhaps not surprising given that this is the this is at the public heart of the Vatican City. And note that all these obelixes, right? They're in central points. Cameras tend to be directed towards St. Peter's Basilica and its iconic Renaissance dome, which dominates the skyline of Rome. Another monument also features prominently in these images. That is the obelisk that stands at the center of the square. Remember, center. An obelisk that was brought to Rome from Egypt, aka Kemet, by Caligula in 37 AD. But why does the Vatican have a 4,000 year old Kemetic? They said Egyptian, but I'm saying Kemetic obelisk. What answer could they possibly give you to convince you? They've already told you that it came from you. The almighty Vatican took one of your artifacts. They uprooted it in the 7 AD. You see, this is what I'm saying. These things harness power and their spiritual, they would say, spiritual significance and ramifications. Why didn't they just build a replica? Why did they have to get the specific one from Egypt and uproot it in the financial capital of the world? Hmm. So here's the answer. There are a number of ancient Egyptians obelisks standing in Rome. In fact, eight of them, the further five obelisks were made by Roman stone cutters. An interesting fact about the e Eternal City is that there are more erect obelisks from Egypt in Rome than there are anywhere else in the world, including Egypt. There are more obelisks in Rome than in Kemet, where it came from. They were all brought to Rome by various Roman emperors. This particular example, often called the Vatican obelisk and sometimes Caligula's obelisk, is the only ancient Kemetic obelisk in Rome to have remained standing since Roman times. So all this time, 
it's still there, it's still standing, the specific one from the 7 AD. You see how, how deep it goes. So uh, another point I wanted to bring, because remember I just told you that there's um, the London, London Metal Exchange as long as we determine the, the, the prices, right, of, of minerals in the world. But let me show you something relating to the Adam's calendar. It is important to note that the mysterious ruins of Southern Africa, which include Great Zimbabwe and millions of similar ruins in that country, also extend into neighboring areas like Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, Kenya and Mozambique. But why were these ancient people here in the first place? What were they doing? The past 200 years has been a number of explorers writing in great detail about these ruins. But their findings may have largely forgotten about their books and their books are out in print. Most of these early explorers write about thousands of ancient mine shafts found in close proximity to these ruins. In fact, most of these mines have been described as gold mines, copper, tin and iron mines. In my personal experience and research, I have found at least 25 ancient mine shafts in gold rich areas and been told about dozens more by farmers all over South Africa. Ancient mines covered by 30 meters of soil have been reported by at least two miners in the 30s, 1930s, in the province of Lipopo, and more than 75,000 mines have been reported by geological companies in Kumalanga. It seems that gold mining has been going on here for a bit longer than most of us ever imagined. We were mining gold and minerals as well. That's how advanced they were. It's not a new phenomenon, you see? Then remember I told you about um, the pyramids and the sphinx. So the sphinx is what um, is like those big statues which depicts a human face with the body of a lion and sometimes with the wings of a dragon. Sometimes, that's how it's depicted. The one with the noses knocked off, those things are called sphinx. So this is now again in relation to that terms calendar. So it's like what was happening south is mirrored north. So it said, the discovery of the bird statue that resembles Horus carved out of the dolerite, a small sphinx about 1.5 meters long carved out of the same dolerite rock, a, pet, a petrol glyph of a winged disc, many carvings of Sumerian crosses in circles and an arm in a radiating circle suggest that the prototype Sumerian and Egyptian civilizations had their origins in Southern Africa thousands of years before they emerged north. Are you hearing that? Mm. Yes, so Rim also told you that these pyramids harness energies and he also said that sound engineering was also involved in the building of these pyramids. Remember I said that the, the pyramids are like, he caught them, he, he, he likened them that to like tolling bells. Yeah, so why is this important? Why am I bringing that? Because remember what I told you about sound, about how sound is like. I want to tell you about semantics. Semantics is the study of wave phenomena, especially sound, and their visual representations. So Mr. Producer Sir, did you know that sounds have got visual representations? I've heard of something like that. Yeah. So I haven't seen it. Yeah, they have experiments where they 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 got two bottles. Right? Mm -hmm. One was showered with love and one was held in sound. Mm -hmm. Right? And then this one showed a particular pattern mm -hmm. and the other one showed a particular pattern. Then they got another thing uh, and two more containers. One was, uh, was given positive affirmations mm -hmm. and the other one was given negative affirmations. Guess what, guess what the results were? Mm -hmm. The same pattern that was formed in the bottom. Yes, of the good. So yeah. good, love, positive vibrations have a similar uh, similar visual representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the negative and low vibration sounds also have a visual representation. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So this is what semantics is. But I want to show you um, how uh, semantics is used. Using a computerized instrument, somatic therapists direct healing frequencies into the body to restore harmony. The healing frequencies are related to those emitted by a healthy organ or body part. In this way, somatic healers say the immune system and other natural regulatory functions are stimulated. If a person is sick, that means they have some sort of low vibration within them. Yeah. 
Yeah. So using semantics, when you say, oh no, this is radio wave, whatever mm. process, yeah. They're emitting sound waves of positivity and love and positive affirmation into that person. They got that sound visual pattern yeah. from the pattern that they saw that resulted in positivity from saying good things mm. to a certain pattern or emitting certain energy to a certain pattern. Yeah. yeah. So that's where the visual representation comes from. That's also very quite interesting. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, in my opinion. That sound has um, visual, representation. visual representation, yeah. So then back to the obelisk. I've talked about the one in Vatican. So London, I told you, they have one just by the river Thames. Right? That's the financial capital. Then they have one in St. Peter's Square, in the heart of it. That's the spiritual capital, the Vatican. And then they have another one in Washington, D.C. But the one in Washington, D.C. was there. And it's called the George Washington Monument. George Washington, the first president of America, who, by the way, was also a Mason. Admittedly, I'm not accusing him. <laughs> the obelisk can be seen in the back of this picture, the Pentagon. The Pentagon is the center of the pentagram, and this is why the symbol obsess Illuminati have located the headquarters of the U.S. military in such a building. This is from a book by David Icke called Children of the Matrix. Here's another thing that I want you to look this is where our symbolism comes in. So the theme of this is Africa is the original, you see? So here you have an example of the so-called Holy Trinity. And then they also have this obsession with reptiles and dragons and flying creatures. I don't know if I mentioned it or if it was edited out. Thank you, Mr. Producer, for <laughs> some of the things I say. <laughs> Too deep. <laughs> yeah, so I think maybe this, this part uh, may have been uh, edited out. I was yeah. talking about the United Nations statue mm -hmm. that resembled the, like a dragon and a flying hawk. So these people have that same similar obsession. So here we see the flying reptiles holding the cross of St. George, which stand at the entrance of the city of London. Why do they have that at the city of London, you see? Then here are three others. The symbol of Thor and his Nordics was the god, and this later evolved into the unicorn. Thus we have the symbolism of the lion, controlling and imprisoning the tethered human race and their great enemies, the Nordics. Notice also the great similarity between the royal crest and that of the house of the Rothschild. If you don't know what the Rothschilds are and you're watching this show, turn this off right now. <laughs> Complete with lion, unicorn, and, and, and flare. The Greek hero Prometheus is a version of Thor. According to Wardo, and he is depicted in chains being tortured by the gods for trying to educate humanity and give them illumination. He is often depicted holding the flame of knowledge. The coat of arms of the city of London, one of the global centers of the cult is St. George's Cross being held by two flying reptiles. When you drive into the city alongside the river Thames, you pass two flying reptiles holding the cross of St. George. As I mentioned before, the reptilian bloodline has placed the gold statue of Prometheus in the Rockefeller Center in New York City. There is Prometheus with the flame. Then they also have the Statue of Liberty as well, which was a gift from the French, by the way, holding the flame to symbolize illumination because they think they've brought a new age. You see? Then we also have the, the United Nations logo with 33, which just so happens to be a degree of masonry. This is a white man now, David I, talking about the same Adam's calendar. The ancient sacred sites of the world, like Stonehenge, are points on the global energy grid where many forces, where many force lines or ley lines cross and create a massive vortex of energy. This is where the stone circles, pyramids, and major Freemasonic temples are located. Energy is equal to power if you know how to use it. You see? So then, um, just to bring in some quotes to lighten the book mood a bit, mm -hmm. this one is by George Orwell, um, the author of 1984 and Animal Farm. He says, Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. Why do you think it's important to control the past? And then there's another uh, quote by uh, Voltaire. History is the lie commonly agreed upon. So remember what I just told you about these 
pyramid structures harnessing energy, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why society today and any corporation or organization is run in a hierarchical order. So for instance, if you look at this pyramid right here, right? What happens is this. The majority of the people are bottom of the pyramid. Yeah. The higher you go, the fewer levels. And the higher you go, the less people. The higher you go, the more information about how all the pieces of the pyramid fit together go. So for instance, a uh, simple example, if somebody, let's say, is a, is a footballer, right? There are many footballers, so that means that the bottom of the pyramid. Then above that, it will be managers, because there are, there are less managers mm -hmm. than footballers. Then from the footballers goes to the people who run the club, and so on and so forth. Then when you reach at the top, you find, before the top, maybe you find FIFA, and then you find the owners, you see? Yeah. But the players, the people who are making up the majority, there's no football without the players, mm -hmm. but they know the list, because you don't know how much they're making, you just know your salary. You don't know which players they plan on signing. They can't even come and tell you. You don't know if they're even planning to sell you or not. So this yeah. is an example of why corporations and organizations today uh, are, are running a hierarchical structure because of the energy that's formed by pyramids. One of the smart things that our ancestors did was that our tradition is oral. What I'm doing right now is ancient African history. It's only that there's no fire to sit around. Mm -hmm. But that's what we do, we talk. Now Rogan does it and now he's getting half a meal for what our ancestors <laughs> created <laughs> centuries ago. So what they did was that they had rock paintings and they, they had helographics. They never wrote, even though ancient Kemets created ink and paper. You should know that too. Which even gets me to another point, because I gave a quote which was based on hip hop. Mm -hmm. So I'm also uh, going to make a point as to how um, hip hop is indeed African culture. Okay. So, hip hop has been five elements DJ, MC, graffiti, mm -hmm. B boy, and knowledge of self. People forget the B boy. Knowledge of self. Yeah, so knowledge of self, that's what we've been doing all day right now. We're teaching us about ourselves, how we live, knowledge of self. That's one element of hip hop. Because the DJ, what does the DJ do? He's the one who keeps the party ignited. That's the person around the fire who's keeping the party going, who's leading the dances and the chants mm -hmm. in the ceremonies. Then what do we have? b boy. b boy is a form of dancing or dance expression. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to mention who are the gods are dancing. Yeah. That's African culture. Then you have MC. Uh, which, which, which one? Oh, graffiti. Yeah. Graffiti is the rock paintings by the sun, mm -hmm. you know, graffiti by the Egyptians. So you see how hip hop is in the African culture. Uh, I also wanted to bring to your attention that there are remixes. Africa is the original. So let me let me tell you what I mean. So look at this picture right here. I want to show you that Africa is the original. In fact, I just want to show you that the Jesus Christ story has been remixed. That's the remix. There were already people having that story in different civilizations. So enough talking. So let me start with your faith. Jesus Christ. He was born of a virgin, born in December, born on December 25th. He performed miracles, had 12 disciples, he died for three days, resurrected and was called the Savior. That's Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Then you have Tammuz. He's from Sumeria. Ancient Sumerian and Babylonian deity. Born of a virgin earth. Killed then resurrected. He his cross sign is the first letter of his name. His name, Thomas, means Savior Son. Mm -hmm. Remember I just told you that ancient Sumeria could be uh, debated as one of the earliest civilizations. Yeah. So imagine they had that in Sumeria. Then they have Mithra, ancient Persian deity, born of a virgin, born on December 25th, performed miracles, had 12 disciples. He was dead for three days, resurrected, and the day of worship was on Sunday. Then we have Krishna in Hinduism, supreme deity of Hinduism, born of a virgin called Devaki, was baptized in, in the river Ganges, performed miracles, was crucified till death, resurrected. His name was Jesus Krishna. Jesus means pure essence. He was also called the Savior. Okay. Then you have Artis. Mm, I don't know how you pronounce that, but it's from Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. One of a virgin called Nana, 
born on December 25th had 12 disciples, mm-hmm. been to a tree till death for mankind. Mm-hmm. Resurrected after three days, guess what? He was also called saved. Then now let's go to Kemet. We had Horus, 3000 BC, ancient Egyptian date, born on December 25th, was baptized in the river now, performed miracles, had 12 disciples, dead for three days and resurrected. Wow. You have Adonis, Greek mythology, born December 25th, his name uh, derived from the title, that means my lord, was planned to be murdered using wild boar. Goddess Astrid loved him and tried to save his life. Mary Magdalene. Mm-hmm. He was courageous and brave enough to stand by Jesus in the house of suffering. He is erected by order from heaven. Then Dionysius, Greek god, born December 25th, was god of wine and wine making, claimed to have miracles of turning water into wine. Um, he, took, he was torn to pieces and eaten by the titans, given his blood as a sacrifice, resurrected from the dead after three days. So let me even add in another version, an African version of that. Um, you may remember I mentioned something about Adam's calendar and when the new year is. So this same thing of he died and resurrected after three days is a remix of the spring equinox because equal spring equinox is when there's equal days and equal nights. The energies of the earth are in equilibrium. Remember the golden meridian I told you about? The electromagnetic field of the earth. Those are the things, the energies that are triggered during that period, the spring equinox. And guess what? From the 21st to the 23rd, which is like three days, that's how long it takes for the sun to emerge in the southern hemisphere. So that's what they mean, oh, the sun died and rose again. So it's just a metaphor at the end of the day. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, salutations for listening. I know this took a left turn, but uh, bear with me. This is the symbolism I wanted to talk about. I wanted to prove that the symbolism that your faves use was actually taken from Africa. So um, that is that. That is symbolism, lesson five, uh, the master class. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh, see you on the next lesson. This week's prescribed readings will be in the description. In case uh, you're curious or you want to go down the rabbit hole and embark on this journey of truth and self actualization, drop in the description box.